think uh, 41 has ended, right? Yeah, 41 participants have joined uh, till now. So I think we can just start, sir, because it's just two minutes oh, to right go. Now, right now. Yeah. Uh, even, uh, good speeches. afternoon, all the uh, participants. Uh, hearty welcome to the second of the lecture series uh, of ICPR, hosted by the Department of Philosophy, Government College for Women, Tiruvannamalai. I welcome each and every participant uh, to uh, this lecture series. Uh, at the outset, I wish to welcome our beloved principal, who is, who is really a pillar of support for all our activities, who is a very deep well-wisher of the department. I request him to speak a few words to us. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Today, I am very lucky to have a seat the resource person. Uh, uh, Madam Sangeeta Menon, and she will be delivering on a very important topic, the basics of philosophy, knowledge, and life purpose. At the very outset, I am also welcoming all the participants who has shared or who has used the platform even in the pandemic uh, uh, COVID-19. I'm sorry to say that uh, if there's no such a situation remains, this sort of webinars will be, will be organized by the department uh, in a very uh, dialectical, very enthusiastic, very philosophical mood. Uh, okay. At the very outset, I would like to say that and the research scholars as well as the students who has taken much keen about the uh, importance of uh, philosophy uh, is going to be delivered by the resource person. You have a sense of a sight and a imbibe to take the, to, to take the relics of uh, uh, this particular topic. Nor of the particular topic shared by the resource person. Anyhow, from the uh, very basics, uh, the philosophy means uh, it's a love of wisdom. Today is the Valentine's Day, so the love creates some immemorable uh, moments to everyone. What philosophers do and then point to the writings of eminent scholars in the field, such as Aristotle, Plato, Descartes, Hume, and Hume, Hume uh, Immanuel Kant, Russell. And the most distinctive feature is its use of the logical argument. The second phase when it comes about the knowledge. The epistemology, you might have heard about the research scholars, uh, knowledge. Every knowledge has its own reason to understand. So either it is empirical or based on the principles and the attitudes, whether it is true or false, is to be distinguished by the eminent candidate. And theory of knowledge means jnana, 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 avadhi, mana prayana, and kevala. <laughs> Analytic and synthetic judgments are to be made between reasons. Contingent and necessity Truths. This can be taken over by the Western philosophers. As far as Indian philosophers are concerned, they try the knowledge they have acquired. By searching the knowledge, we have to the different fields of aspects, not for the four directors from the north to south. But luckily or unluckily, we have to have philosophers. Maybe the truth spirit, they are called the Western philosophy. 
I think uh, we have uh, we have to study one paper on the western philosophy itself. Then the Indian philosophers will always speak intuitive knowledge. The knowledge is perceptual or non-perceptual. Whether it can be feel or uh, something like the non-feel or uh, uh, touching on the dead body. But what we have to know that whether it is live or uh, dead or live will be taken over by the feel in which the uh, knowledge is to be assumed through certain theories. And this can be attributed to sustain the life processes is the last step of the today's topic. With a few words, I take this opportunity to all the organizers who are directly or indirectly participating to conduct such a seminar. Uh, I am very honored to be that the seminar is hosted by the Department of Philosophy, Government College for Women, Tiruvananthapuram. Uh, I thank all the organizers of the college, are the part, all the participants from inside the college, inside the Tiruvananthapuram, outside the Tiruvananthapuram, outside the state, etc., etc. Anyhow, thank you very much for how to have a meeting. Uh, our these through electronic uh, gadgets, and uh, I think the students will be much benefited by the uh, resource persons or the today's topic taken over by the resource person. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Vijay, Dr. Gaspar, and Dr. Nazneen and other uh, well-wishers who had uh, given me an opportunity to, to talk with this time right now. The time is 3.15, uh, the examiners, the examination is going on. And on behalf of all the college, and on behalf of all the well-wishers of the college, I take this opportunity to thank once again, one and all. Thank you very much. We will be the organizers. We will be deliver. We will be seeing, or we will be looking into the matter very seriously on tomorrow and have a good dream. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arvind sir. Thank you uh, very much for your encouraging words. You have always been a pillar of support to the department encouraging us in all our academic activities. Uh, thank you very much, sir, once again. I now request uh, our research scholars, research scholar Nikhila Nagapan to introduce our uh, honorable resource person. Over to you, Nikhila. OK, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pride and privilege to introduce to the participants the resource person for today's ICPR. Uh, lecture professor Sangeeta Menon, one of the tallest and brightest speakers in philosophy in India currently. She is currently serving as professor and head of the Department of Consciousness Studies program of National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. She joined NIAS in 1996 and ever since it has been a flight of excellence. She is the dean of the School of Humanities at NIAS. Her major areas of research and expertise including philosophy of psychology, Indian philosophy, consciousness, uh, consciousness studies, philosophy and psychology of self, bio and neuroethics, and neurophilosophy. She collaborates with fellow researchers in creating and encouraging a first-person centered approach to understanding consciousness and cognitive capabilities that favors experiential well-being for all. Professional manuals, profe professional qualifications include degrees in biology, philosophy, and psychology. Uh, she secured her post graduation from a college, Government College for Women, Trivandrum, with a university first rank and gold medal. Her thesis for doctoral degree was on the concept of consciousness in the Bhagavad Gita. She has authored several books and research articles and has hundreds of research presentations to her crediting platforms within India and abroad, including a TED talk. I run short of words to adequately describe. Our most distinguished resource person, I express my humble salutation to her and welcome her for this ICPR lecture. She will end, end, enlighten us on the theme, basics of philosophy, knowledge, self, and life purpose. 
वेलकम मैम थैंक यू निखिला आई नाउ रिक्वेस्ट आवर डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर प्रोफेसर संगीता मेनून टू टेक ओवर द माइक एंड एन लाइटनेस हार्टी वेलकम टू यू मैम namaste and uh, good afternoon uh, uh, at the outset uh, many thanks to uh, the principal of the college professor krishnan for being there and uh, sharing your own philosophical wisdom and uh, many thanks to dr nasneen uh, who invited me and dr vijay is a good friend and being here and also nikila uh, nikila if i remember her name right to introduce me and all of you there who are now present in the form of circles is it possible to see if there is a face behind these circles if you don't have a problem with the bandwidth because we know what happens behind the circles right it's a secret openly out so if possible please show your videos and if you are busy i definitely understand that you would have better things to do on a sunday and on a valentines day <laughs> so if possible show your video if you are there and perhaps if you are not speaking can you just mute your microphone so that we don't have other microphones coming in between i think there are a few microphones which are not muted so i can hear other voices All right so it looks like there are only two or three faces others is there a reason that why you don't want to show your faces um, is it a bandwidth issue or a, what exactly is the issue ma'am uh, we have actually advised all the participants to mute their audio and video so that uh, because of the ban bandwidth issue so that uh, the, the system does not hang i see that is the reason ma'am but uh, if uh, ma'am so uh, desires uh, i request all the participants to uh, switch on their video but uh, kindly mute your audio thank you Good afternoon, ma'am. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah. So, well, philosophers have to talk face to face. So it's very important we see each other. And philosophy begins with an honest conversation. Conversation between people who really exist, whether it's digital space or not digital physical space. so that's why i requested whether if you can show your faces because uh i know that in colleges we just log in and then we disappear we don't you know we all, we know all those tricks so particularly in colleges that do happen but uh you know i i guess if it is not mandatory perhaps you should not waste your time you should just log out and leave but if you are there just make sure that you are there because what i wanted to uh do today is a conversation first of all thank you for being there on a sunday and on valentines day and on the afternoon after perhaps a good lunch this is not the time to discuss uh, philosophy right so uh so once again i thank uh, dr nasneen since i see her now and dr vijay for uh, uh, inviting me and it was also good to hear from nikila who mentioned about my connection with the institute and that's one reason that I didn't want to miss this opportunity and uh, be with all of you because I still have memory of those corridors of those rooms department of philosophy and the teachers there of course I don't think any one of them were, who were there at that time are there now uh, they have retired uh, or uh, left the college and so on and so forth all right um, uh so what i wanted to uh, have share with you or discuss with you on a day like this which is the day of love 
is what is love for wisdom? Because philosophy is love of love for wisdom, right? So what do we understand by wisdom? What do we understand by love? Which of course are very interesting questions, right? Particularly in today's world, both the questions are fundamentally very important. Is there something called love? Is there something which can be called as wisdom? Or is there something at all which is fundamental? Uh, please remember that philosophy is not just thinking, right? Philosophy is not just theorizing. Philosophy is not just reading a text. Philosophy is not just talking meaningless things. Well, because many philosophers are uh, often ridiculed that whatever they speak, nobody understands. So philosophy as the name of a discipline, which is perhaps important, but no one understands. But do you agree with that? Is that the role of philosophy? Is philosophy a discipline to be talked about, but nobody understands? Or is philosophy something else? So I think it's very important that by coincidence, Dr. Nasmin has uh, scheduled the lecture today, which is on the day for love. To speak for that, I can speak on love for wisdom. And uh, when philosophy started, well, it didn't start just in Western uh, geographical areas. It also started in Eastern regions as well. So wherever it started, it started in the streets, it started in the marketplace, or it started in pilgrimages, centers of pilgrimages. It started in forests. And at times it even started at homes. So you would see the uh, conversation between Yatnyavalkya and Maitri. So this very beautiful conversation. Uh, and uh, uh, so that was not a setting which is, you know, a very formal um, uh, departmental space, but it was a very informal space. And where Socrates and Aristotle and the Greek philosophers, where they talked about philosophy, it was not a formal space. It was this place in the marketplace or street place. So streets and markets are always considered as very important to discuss philosophy. Have you thought about it? Why? The streets, markets, and other commoners areas are specifically for people who can ask questions, think about fundamental issues without getting into a, perhaps a formalized structure. So philosophy to begin with is about thinking, thinking that starts with where our feet is grounded. So I wanted to make that introduction to tell you why philosophy is important or who can be a philosopher because uh, some of you might say that I'm not a philosopher, I've just joined MA philosophy or BA philosophy so that I get a degree. Well, well I don't know what to answer to those kind of uh, conjunctures possibly, but if you have taken philosophy for out of some interest, but still you believe that perhaps you're not a philosopher, ask this question, do you think fundamentally? Can you think on fundamental questions? Because if you can think about fundamental questions, then you are touching at least the surface of philosophy. Because philosophy is something which shakes your beliefs, your perceptions. And it's good to be shaken, isn't it? It's good to be critiqued and to sh be shown a mirror so that we know uh, in what place we are, what time we are. So if you ask, what is philosophy? Philosophy is definitely an enterprise of love. But it's an enterprise of love which is pointed to wisdom. And wisdom is asking fundamental questions. Wisdom is not forgetting the place where you are grounded, and that can be anywhere. And wisdom is also the ability to ground everything in a commoner space. That is why philosophy started in streets, in marketplace, or in households. Now, having said that, have you also thought about what are the basics of philosophy? Let's say, you're a philosopher, then uh, if I ask you, what is philosophy? You should be able to tell me the basics of philosophy. What do you think basically is philosophy is without getting into very theoretical uh, presuppositions? 
because the philo finally philosophy has something to be talked about something to be understood by another person if what you say cannot be understood by another person i don't think it can be philosophical it can be very textual it can be a lot of jargons there but still if it is not communicative then it has to be reflected upon because ultimately philosophy is between is it's about the relationship between you and me a relationship between your your life and the world the relationship between objects relationship between life and non life and so on and so forth so there has to be a conversation without conversation there is no philosophy so if you ask about basics of philosophy then we have to talk about what connects us to this world if i ask you what connects you to this world or how are you seated in this world or how are you grounded in the world you live your life right and i'm sure all of you right that's why you make your choices perhaps not to sit on the video or not to you know perhaps participating in this uh, program but yet to yet you want to be part of it in some way so we make a lot of choices sometimes very nuanced choices so we do make choices and uh, we are connected in our in our world in the world which we live by making choices because making choice is a sign of living in the world if you don't make choice then you are not living in the world so how do we make choices how do we make choices in our daily life and that brings us to the most important basic of philosophy which is knowledge right so many of you would start perhaps a philosophy course in your college with uh, learning continental philosophy and so on and so forth our greek philosophy or indian philosophy but uh, in where which of the system is you all would agree that knowledge is a key word right if you take a class by any of your teacher perhaps that keyword is going to be the uh word which is going to get largest number of hits in that entire course which he or she will teach you that is the importance of knowledge knowledge is one of the very important keyword of philosophy and to come back to what we were discussing that in order to connect with the light, uh, world we live we have to make choices as i said the choice to switch on your video or not to switch on your video to be present at this uh, uh lecture program or not to be present and so on and so forth so many choices some connectivity problem vijay yeah it's not working her frame has free frozen her frame is frozen now uh, <coughs> hope she returns soon jay kekka pattunilla Dr. Minita, Dr. Sangeeta's uh, frame, I think there's a connectivity issue over there. Okay. The frame appears to have frozen. Okay. I think she will be joined. Yeah, yeah, she will be joined. Yeah, Sorry about that. I think there was a uh, internet uh, yeah. problem from my side. Apologies for that. 
I'm back. I hope you're also there. And I hope I'm audible. Yeah, it's audible, ma'am. Very clear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so what we were trying to discuss is that choice making is very much related with knowledge. And choice making is also related with our life connected with the world. We live in, in this world, in our, we live our life because we have the ability to make choices. But to make choices, we depend upon what is called as knowledge. From one point of view, you could say that uh, knowledge is something which is very uh, sophisticated or complicated because the very word knowledge it has a lot of uh, patronizing attributes also along with it, right? People who have knowledge are sometimes considered to be on the higher side or the upper side of the Ecclion, and they, make, they get to make the decisions. So knowledge, possessors of knowledge also have connections or are connected within a community which is directed by decisions which are of the nature of an order of power and hierarchy. Well, we wouldn't go into those details of uh, uh, patronizing forces of community uh, constitution itself. But uh, uh, today we will only understand or try to understand knowledge as a process or as an entity which is available to anyone in spite of being in whichever a uh, platform of the society you are. So, so please keep a track of what I'm trying to tell you or what we are trying to discuss so that you can also engage in a discussion a little later. And I hope you really would. So remember the basics of philosophy and one of the basics of philosophy is knowledge. And what is knowledge? Knowledge is that which empowers us to make choices. But in order to make choices, you need to have what is called as knowledge, which, is, which can be a process or which can be uh, an entity itself. And uh, so what, what is knowledge? How do we understand knowledge? I almost want to ask one of you to say, what is knowledge? And by the way, this Google Meet also has something called as the chat box. If you have not used it, you should use it. So even if you're not able to speak or if you're not to respond, please type out in the chat box. I hope for that there won't be enough bandwidth needed. So if I'm uh, requesting you to sh share your response for a question, please do type in that chat box and let me know your responses. What is knowledge according to you? Do you agree with me that knowledge is one of the fundamentals or the basics of philosophy? So I would like you to respond to that. So if you are there, please do type out your responses in the chat box. I see about 80 people in the group now. So I'm assuming at least some of you will respond. So what is knowledge? So no answers have come. So are you all saying that knowledge cannot be communicated in words and that's why you're not typing out anything? Well, that's one way of looking at knowledge. And there are many people who believe that knowledge cannot be communicated because knowledge is too complex or too layered. But then let's only talk about knowledge which can be communicated, which perhaps is layered, but still has a structure which we can understand. OK, I see one response. Dr. Manimala Sharma says knowledge is insight. Dr. Saumia Arvi, new experience. I'm assuming uh, both Dr. Manimala Mila and Dr. Saumia would be faculty members. Uh, I'm also requesting the students to share your views and chat boxes. And thank you, Dr. Manimala Sharma and Dr. Saumia for giving those, those responses. Yes, that's right. Uh, Dr. I can't read that uh, name, Dr. Bhuvaneshwari, I think. Knowledge is power. Yeah, that's the old very famous uh, dictum, right? Well, knowledge is also connecting something which we know to something very much aware about. 
Yes, that's right. Meera Krishnan just took my keyword. She said, knowledge is awareness. And, uh, and Raj, Rajwa says, an awareness of some aspect of the world. Yeah, very true. Absolutely. I really like these uh, responses. So please do, do respond. Knowledge is awareness or understanding of someone or something. Shivraj Rudra. Abhay Dalal. Know some, know some getting new ideas and philosophy. Knowledge is wisdom. Everything we see and learn in our society, that's knowledge. Uh, these are all names. Are these people studying in women's college? Who are these people? Because I don't get to know. No, uh, names looks some like some of them. Yeah, some of them are. Uh, they've just joined uh, the program also. They're not students. They are not students, right? Okay. All right. Yeah, and, and Anjana writes, knowledge is the eagerness to discover new things. That's absolutely nice. Knowledge is the eagerness. Don't you see that very experiential quality in knowledge? And someone already said, knowledge is a lot to do with experience. Yes, absolutely. That idea of eagerness, and uh, Dr. Vijay would agree with me that phenomenological pulse, which you see that in definition, in that definition. And today is our student, ma'am. <laughs> I'm sorry? And today is our student. Oh, that's good to say. That's good to know. And knowledge is knowing what to say. Rash, Rupsana R. Is she a student? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, I, really, I, really, I really hope if you show your face because I, I, you know, you relate with people having faces. So not these circles with a letter R, yes, yes, G, A, you know, we are still not in that mode completely. But but that, I think, is a very interesting definition. Knowledge is knowing what to say. And uh, the other definition, like knowledge is eagerness, knowledge is curiosity and enthusiasm. Very, very interesting uh, definitions. Knowledge gives us deeper perception, yes, very much. But I think, let me focus on what Ruksana R said. Knowledge is knowing what to say. And let me extend that a little bit to uh, what Anjana said about knowledge is the eagerness to discover new things because both are connected. The one is to articulate. When you say knowledge is, gives you the ability to say what, what you have to say something, or saying means also that you respond. And responding need not be always verbal, it can also be with other, you know, other sensational mecha sensory mechanisms. And, uh, but then there's, there's also something which inspires us to say. And that I think what, uh, 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 what Anjana described as the eagerness. So we are eager to connect with the world, isn't it? We are eager to connect with the world out there. We are eager to connect with people out there. We are eager to connect with objects out there. So the eagerness seems to be something which is very, very much fundamental in our life. And uh, there could be other synonyms for eagerness, but I, I think I like that word because it's a simple, simple word and which is very uh, commonly available in, in, in today's world as well. And, uh, but as Ruksana also pointed out, knowledge is also knowing what to articulate because once you are eager or once you are uh, sufficiently inspired to relate with the world you are also supposed to respond to what you receive well, well in a technical word stimulus but it's slightly uh, hackneyed word so i wouldn't use that word so i would say that we relate with the world all the time so we receive information we receive enough cues, we receive enough encouragement, and basically we live in a world which has a context, as a background, as a foreground as well. And if we are in the foreground, we are supposed to place ourselves. So placing ourselves within a background is responding. And uh, what you said in that simple language, Ruksana, that knowledge is knowing what to say, is the ability to articulate. And we articulate in very many ways. Articulate verbally, 
articulate by forming a certain belief of ours and articulate also by transforming the belief into a strong conviction and making that into a world view. So all this is possible. So in order to do this, we have to understand knowledge as a causal relation. To relate with something which is already there to something which is not yet there, perhaps it is in the process of its making. So knowledge can be understood primarily as a causal relation. And what is a causal relation? We all use that in our daily life. What causes what? Your teacher asks, why are you late today? Oh, ma'am, there was a, a bus delay. The bus didn't come in time. So there's a causal relation between the delay in your attending or arriving at your class and the bus at the bus station or the driver of that bus. I hope you're following me. So there is a relation between something which has happened and something which has caused that. The causal relation is something which we all use in a day-to-day -day basis because that is something which is default in our life. And that is how we progress, we proceed with our understanding. We connect with something which is perhaps known very well and something not completely known. And uh, causal relation also, as you would know, is something which is very fundamental to scientific thinking. If you, if you, if you would uh, agree, or if of course you can disagree, that's why I said if you could, would agree, scientific reasoning is based on a cause effect relation. So all that which you see today as the development of scientific thinking is embedded on a cause effect relation. Whether you take the Newtonian times or the later Einsteinian time of quantum mechanics and uh, thinking in a dynamic way and living in a dynamic way of physical space. So cause effect relation seems to be very, very fundamental to thinking itself. And please remember, we are not talking about just a very sophisticated modern world alone. Though I mentioned about scientific thinking, which is perhaps 200, 250 years old only. But are we saying that the cause, causal relation is a product of only the modern world, modern scientific thinking? Can it go beyond that? Did philosophers think causally? Did philosopher connect one point to the other point and then try to arrive at a relation in order to articulate, in order to express their eagerness in more sophisticated ways? I'm connecting what Anjana and Ruksana said. And uh, the two responses which they gave have actually uh, given a nice uh, a formula for what is knowledge. Now, uh, to come back to that question, how old is causal relation itself? Well, if you take the advent of Homo sapiens, right, that could be perhaps a few uh, million years, uh, the advent of Homo sapiens. But can you, can you say that uh, uh, the thinking or the thinking as we see today happened only from since the advent of the homo sapiens did it happen then or was it there before but let us take only the perhaps uh, at that stage of the evolutionary uh, history of human life but then you can also say perhaps it didn't start with that evolutionary history it had to become we had to become a civilization in order to be a thinking person so the human civilization as history books talk about it are only a few thousand years back, right? 5,000, 6,000 years. So are you saying that people started thinking only 6,000 years back, we didn't think? I hope you will, you, you really think about this question. Please, please respond to that. When did people start thinking? Well, if you say, if, let's say if you, if you take a 
civilizations, which is a few thousand years, six, uh, 5,000 to 6,000 years. And uh, we know about the hunter-gatherer uh, existence, right? It is basically still on a prey-predator mode. You, you hunt, you get your food, you live, and you compete with your, uh, uh, your inhabitant, co-inhabitant, or you coexist with your co-inhabitant. So a hunter-gatherer society which used competition and tools in order for their survival, that perhaps is the first stage where we can say that there is a community which is built up. And a community is when there are a group of people who are interacting and who are also dependent on a common set of resources. But then if there is a common set of resources, and if there are a community of people, isn't it challenging? Think about it. Let's say in your canteen, I'm hoping that canteen is there in women's college, or I don't know, I don't, I don't remember very well. If there's a canteen and um, your canteen has made only perhaps five vadas that day, you know, all the vada has gone, only five vada is left and you are eight people who are coming there as a group of friends, but only five vadas, what do you do? And the vada are small because you have to ration. In particular, in colleges, you don't make big vadas like in a restaurant, right? There are mini vadas. So how do you how do you approach that? So you're a community of seven people, and then the resources of five vadas. So either you could say that, OK, the one who has more money can buy all of that and can eat all of that. Another person could say, perhaps we will share it and we all will pay equally for the five of us. The other person would say, uh, well, let us not buy anything. We will buy something else. Maybe other than what are they, maybe something else. Another person can say, no, I am the boss of this college or I am the leader of the union. You are not entitled for vadas, all the five vadas, only I am entitled. Definitely that, that's a power position. So there are various ways of approaching a little edible thing called vada. So which means what? Our communication transforms into certain forms of action, which are either of competition, or of coexistence or sharing. So competition would be that you beat up everybody, you destroy everybody, and you take that meat and run away, right? Which you see in the animal world. Or if you look again, if you watch the animal world, even if someone has struggled very hard to get a body of meat, let's say a tiger as Toiled a lot, work with a few other people, killed the deer, and the meat is in front of you. You know, there are other beings in the animal world who will not work very hard, but there are other ways they are aware of to get that meat. They are called the hyenas. Hyenas are very clever animals. They wouldn't hunt a prey like the tigers do, but what they do is they again, they're a community. As a community, they would come threaten the tiger and make the tiger live that meat and have all the meat amongst themselves. So what I'm trying to tell you is that even if you take a primitive society or a community like the animal world, we have also experimented, not experimented, we have lived with competition, defeating another person, coexistence, etc., etc. And that started in the age when we are started using tools, when we started farming. So even before industrialization, we have learned how to exist in a community. And to do all this, what is most important? Knowledge, isn't it? Knowledge is very important. Knowledge of various kinds. Knowledge about the other person, how powerful that person is, because if he's too powerful, then I better change my strategy. So thinking using strategies, which is again, a very important part of knowledge. 
has been used by all of us since the age of civilization. And this is again embedded in what we described earlier as causal relation. What relates to what and what causes something else? So knowledge is primarily a causal relation. But then is that only a causal relation, you can ask me, because the connection between cause and effect is basically a hierarchical connection and it is a linear connection. It's basically a binary, binary like the opposites. But today's world, we don't just get knowledge using linear systems. We also use systems such as network. So, so what we call as network thinking, we call systemic thinking, what we call as holistic thinking, what we call as participative thinking, what we call as uh, transpersonal thinking, all these are there. There are different ways of producing knowledge and also using it. But having said, still the causal relation is a fundamental uh, nature uh, for knowledge to be expressed. Well, since the time is ebbing out and I would like to have some discussion and I'm hoping um, at least through the chat box, people will talk. So I want to ask you one more question or maybe two more questions. And I think I would stop with knowledge there since I wish to say something more about the other two uh, ideas as well. If you keep knowledge apart, there's one another basic which is very important about philosophy and which is what? which is yourself. Well, you might tell me, well, I thought that is more important. Knowledge will come later, right? I am more important. Knowledge will come later, right? Well, well, we don't have time to think about it, but there are reasons why knowledge is more primary and yourself should be kept second, at least, if not third. So yourself is very important. And what are you? At this point, in this Google Meet, basically, to me, you are some with some nice icons, some with some beautiful faces, and some with some beautiful letters. This is what you are. And if I click the people there, a list of participants' names come. I can see the names. So at this point, you are that to me. Well, that's the digital space, but then that's a very limited way of looking at you, right? I know that there is a much richer self which is existing beyond my, the screen of my laptop here. So you have a very rich life there. You have a self. So who are you? Can you answer me that? Who are you? Just like you and responded to what is knowledge. Can you give me a simple answer? Don't laud it from philosophy because philosophers are good in lauding things, not very good in things, saying things in a simple manner. So answer this question, who are you? If I ask you, who are you, how would you answer? Well, the simplest answer will be, I am Sangeeta, right? That's a very genuine, valid answer. So when I ask you, who are you? You can type out, I am Anjana and I am so-and-so, that's a very valid answer. Please don't think that's not a valid answer. But there are, is there any other answer to that? Who are you? Who is that self which is sitting across? Please give me some responses. Because this again is a very fundamental question, particularly a very, very nice answer. Who, I don't know who that person is, Kumari Sunita. She says, I don't know who I am. That's a very good knowledge. Knowledge of the self as pertaining to no knowledge. And that also is a knowledge about the self. Because who is saying that? Who is saying that I don't know who I am? Someone is saying that, right? So in order to say that I have no knowledge, I have to have the knowledge that I have no knowledge. I hope that's not a tongue twister. Even to say I have no knowledge, you need to have that knowledge. Knowledge about what? No knowledge. There's a particular pramana in Indian pramana system, which uh, talks about knowledge of the absence of something on your hand. I hope if you read those books, you will get to know it. I wouldn't go into that. 
Okay, there are some nice answers coming again, Dr. Manimala Sharma saying, process in finding myself. Yes, absolutely right. I mean, you can say that I am a process, absolutely valid. I'm only a peaceful soul, Revi Raj Bhushan. Well, we have to ask, not you, your neighbors, whether you're a peaceful soul. Because your neighbors and your immediate friends would say you're a peaceful soul. Well, uh, that was just a joke for uh, that response. There could be various answers to, uh, now I am a philosophy student. Very good, Akila. Now I'm a, a philosophy student. So that is relating to your profession, your immediate uh, context to define yourself. Uh, Bhumi Jayan describes herself as a child, an artist, a seeker, a work in progress. A very beautiful definition of that because an artist is a child, a child is a seeker, and uh, a seeker is always a work in progress. Uh, absolutely beautiful. I don't know who this person is. I, I'm assuming she must be a student, right? Is she a student? Can you confirm Bhumi who you are? Bhumi was a former student of our uh, college and she's currently a researcher. Okay, very good. It, uh, it would be nice also to see once in a while who you are. Uh, Nidhi H. Nair says, I'm a student. Uh, so, let, from, I mean, you please keep sharing in the chat box uh, to this question, who are you? It's a very difficult question, right? Because it's the most easiest question. It's the easiest question, therefore, to give an answer to is, is very difficult. The most difficult questions are the easiest questions because we think that question is so easy, so we never try to answer them. The difficult questions are those questions we always try to answer. Well, they are not really difficult because you all know, already know some answers. Anjana DB, I am nothing. Why do you say that I am nothing? Do you say that I am nothing because you are stellar space? Because according to as astronomers and people who are working on uh, supernova and other stellar existences, say that you are only just some stellar dust. Yes, in that sense, we are nothing. But uh, if you are using nothing in any other sense of a Western philosopher, that has to be loaded quite a bit because that nothing is something, not merely nothing. So when, I, when we talk about who you, we are, that question is very, very tough because that is the easiest or that is the foremost uh, signal that we are alive. Unless I have a sense of who I am, I will not get up from my bed in the morning and look for a cup of coffee or look to sleep again and switch off the alarm, right? So there is, seems to be a, a fundamental or a sense, a deep sense of self in all of us. In cognitive sciences, they call this as minimal self. What is a minimal self? Is if that is that needs a lot of discussion. I will not go into that. But both in psychiatry and uh, in philosophy, there is a discussion on what is the minimal self. Because philosophy talks about a self which is extended in time and space and also beyond space and time. And for psychiatric uh, discourses and evaluations, it's very important that the self is limited between a space and time. Because in psychiatry, the minimal self is very much dependent on what we call as ownership and agency, owning yourself. Even when that person said, Anjana DB said, I am nothing, I'm sure you own the burden of that nothing, right? Isn't it that nothing too burdensome for you? That's the reason you said you are nothing. So owning what we know, what we don't know, is a very important part of the self. And in psychiatry, as I said, agency and ownership are very important in defining a healthy mind or, or perhaps grading the challenges of your mind. Uh, well, I'm going to be very quick here, and I'm sorry about that. The last is, the last fundamental or the third basic of philosophy I wanted to share with you. I'm sure you would have your own list of basics, okay? I didn't want, I didn't mean to say these are the three basics. Well, these are the three basics as I sit here this afternoon on the Valentine's Day 
talking about love for wisdom for the college for women. I'm sure there could be very different kinds of basics, very different ways of looking at it. So the third basic, according to me, and uh, some of you may agree with me, some of you may not, is life purpose. And life purpose has been variously philosophized by philosophers, East, West, and uh, all parts of the world, which is basically, where do you go? What some of you described as work in progress. What is that work? What is that which is progressing? And where is that progress taking you to? So life purpose, which is basically, what is that which is leading you to? What is the ultimate space where you have to be? If at all there has to be ultimate, you may also say, okay, my ultimate is just that at five o'clock I have to catch a bus. That could be your ultimate purpose for the day. So it again depends upon your framework of life, which you contextualize yourself to define a life purpose. But what is interesting about philosophy is, even when the concepts used in a particular philosophical theory are very basic, the idea of purpose is given very important, a lot, lot of importance. What is the purpose of knowledge? What is the purpose of feelings, emotions? And today, please remember that philosophy cannot be excluded from psychology, psychiatry, and other uh, disciplines in humanities. So philosophy is not just about knowledge. Philosophy is also about feelings. And I'm sure you know about the philosophers in the West and philosophers in the East and the Indian philosophers who, talked about, who talks about aesthetics, who believes that feelings are so important to understand your true nature and where you are headed to. So purpose is perhaps limited to the day, perhaps, perhaps limited to two more days, three more days, four more days. It can be incrementally extended to a few days, but it can also be not just extended in time, but it can be extended as a goal, what you want to be, a particular transformation which you want to happen in your life. So when we talk about philosophy, I think it is very important we connect our eagerness to know, articulate, as those students said, also to know what is our nature, whether we are a nothing or whether we are something or we are just a particular entity who is existing. And uh, as Suganya says, or a very emotional being. So that question has to be asked as, as well in the context of knowledge. And both these questions about knowledge and what is the nature of self definitely inspires us to ask, where are you headed to? To catch a bus or to see whether that bus and catching the best has deeper meanings, which means, is there a process to our thinking? Is there a process to our living? Is there a life goal which can help perhaps transform ourselves and a community? Please remember that philosophy is not like perhaps 50, 20, 25 years back, philosophy is the laziest discipline one could take and sleep while speaking or while listening, because you can speak philosophy in fact, by sleeping also, because if your, your words need not be too coherent, right? Because philosophy anyway has the fame of uh, something which is very hard to understand. But that's gone. Philosophy is the fundamental discipline today which commun connects community. If you take climate change, if you take uh, the disparity in uh, resources, if you take the challenges due to the digital space, who, who has the access to digital space and who doesn't have access, if you take health crisis of alternate medicine in almost all areas and challenges that concerns with human communities and human individual as a species, philosophy is so central. So if you're all philosophers sitting there uh, or sitting there, please remember that you have a huge responsibility which you're carrying with. You are going to be the spokesperson for tomorrow. And it has already started. It has already started. In spite of perhaps departments closing down, that's all, story is going to disappear. 
we are going to change the field of philosophy tomorrow and you are going to be those change makers by thinking differently by thinking originally and thinking boldly and bringing philosophy in a context where there is a practice thank you so much thank you ma'am for your wonderful presentation it was very insightful and inspiring thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and ideas now we are moving on to the question and answer session please be free to express your doubts and thoughts you can raise your question in the chat box thank you all so uh, well you can add, uh, respond to the questions which i asked or you can ask me a question or you can answer those questions not necessary that i have responses to all your questions sometimes question is a good answer as well and please remember to articulate okay it's very important that philosophers ask because philosophers are one who has the license always to talk to articulate nobody else like a philosopher has the license to talk because our our profession is to talk but in order to talk we have to think thank you all and i really appreciate your uh, gestures of thanking me if you have any questions or comments to uh, talk about uh, based on this discussion please do share okay dr manipala sharma says can she unmute so maybe they have to be unmuted to ask a question i don't know i think dr manipala says she wants to unmute uh, uh, ma'am uh, myself dr manipala sharma assistant professor of philosophy in uh, rajasthan Oh. government girls college shri ganganagar uh mam ek prashna hai mera main hindi mein pooch sakti hu mam aap pooch lijiye uh hum philosophy ke bare mein bahut kuch jante hain bahut kuch padha bhi hai padhate bhi hain parantu ek jo samasya aati hai us sare gyan ko jeevan mein apply jab karna hota hai या ऐसे सिचुएशन आती है कोई दूसरा जब होता है हम दृष्टा होने की भी बात वेदांत में कर लेते हैं कि दृष्टा होकर देखो आप या माया की जो हम बात करते हैं वो सारी चीजें हमने पढ़ी हुई है पर जब जीवन में ऐसा कुछ हो रहा होता है हमारे साथ में या दूसर हमारे जो नियर डियर है उनके साथ में तब उन चीजों को हमें कैसे अप्लाई करना चाहिए कैसे अंडरस्टैंड करना चाहिए आ, एक्चुअली मेरा जो मोटिव है मेरी जो जर्नी है उसमें मैं ऐसा समझती हूँ कि फिलोसॉफी को एज ए सब्जेक्ट केवल आपने क्लास में जाके पढ़ा दिया आप आ गए दैट्स इट ये नहीं होना चाहिए आप जिन चीजों को पढ़ा रहे हो आप प्रयास करते रहें कितना अपनी लाइफ में कितना उसको जीवन में उतार सकते हैं ये प्रयास है कि टेन परसेंट ट्वेंटी जितना भी हो पाए तो जो थ्योरी और प्रैक्टिकल इसमें बैलेंस क्यों नहीं रह पाता है मैं कहा उन चीजों को नहीं कर पाती हूँ मैं समझ नहीं पाती हूँ इस सिचुएशन को अगर आप थोड़ा उस पर प्रकाश डालेंगे तो मेरे लिए कंफर्टेबल रहेगा थैंक यू मैम या एंड आई होप यू विल अलाउ मी टू स्पीक इन इंग्लिश बिकॉज माई हिंदी विल बी वेरी पोर इफ आई रेस्पॉन्ड टू दैट क्वेश्चन आई थिंक इट्स अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन विच यू हैव रेज विच इज बेसिकली asking if is philosophy a discipline which is as objective as it can be or is the object objective of philosophy itself very much grounded on the subject can there be a philosophy without a subject how was socrates living his life how was aristotle living his life how was yatnavalkya living his life how was kanada living his life how was arjuna living his life and uh, how did abhinav gupta live his life in texan sanjuri kashmir so i think if you look at the history of philosophy whether it's east or west philosophers are very passionate people and they 
do live their life and it is one way of living their life is by encoding their thoughts in the textbooks and their words to bring a real change in life most of the time the change which we want to bring in is in others life not in our life and that's very uh, ironical and i'm going to respond to one other question on that but to bring a change in our life is to perhaps um you know universalize a challenge which we see in our life which perhaps is pulling us down not giving us the enlightenment which is needed so make enlightenment a part of universalizing the challenges we are facing so if we understand that perhaps let us look at grief there are various ways of uh, various sources of grief and uh, if one source of grief is not able to adjust where you are living perhaps to think that this in difficulty to adjust in such a context is not only really with you but many other people and perhaps the cohabitants in your own house or home or community so to universalize the challenge is one way of perhaps living a philosophy uh, which can help us uh, another question is come how how can a philosopher yeah any other question uh, yeah should i read out these questions or somebody wants to ask the question ma'am should uh, we read out the questions to you uh, no i can read but if someone wants to come and ask the question uh, I, i think that's okay but we don't yeah. know if someone Ask to ask a question. Perhaps they should message that request to unmute yourself. Okay. Meanwhile, I think I'm going to read a question. Uh, Raj Wa uh, Raj Was has said, "As you say, philosophers need to talk, but problem arises as few are ready to listen to them." Your views on this issue? I absolutely understand. The only thing which you missed is I said talk. but then listening also we have to do not another person so we are the greatest talkers we are the greatest listeners too it's not that i talk and you listen no i talk and i listen which is called a self reflection the first listening has to be what i talk i talk to myself because if we don't talk and if we don't listen to ourselves we don't expect another person to listen why should i tell i and i expect another person to listen to me nobody need to listen listening is something which has to happen in a deeper level listening happens when there is a concomitant of ideas a consensus or a thinking which is similar between people and to 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 make happen listening we have to debate and dialogue so listening happens when you debate and when you dialogue so that is when people are listening so next time to see whether someone is listening see if someone is debating and dialoguing that's why in the beginning of this lecture i said if at all you show your faces or at least leave your messages in the chat box which is a signal that you are listening because listening is not just keeping quiet listening is debating putting your views differently so as philosophers we are talkers but as philosophers we are also listeners and a good talker will be a good listener and another question as you say philosophers need to yeah i think that we said the other one how can a philosopher make a difference in this world not just theoretically but in ground level realities that's a huge question bhumi uh, and i'm assuming you're a, a former student or a phd scholar now it doesn't matter uh how can you make a philosopher uh, a meaning how can you make yourself a meaningful philosopher in the world well the world is too huge isn't it i mean if at all we define the world as the milky way and imagine the number of milky ways there are there number of galaxies that was is one just galaxy so the world for you can be just the immediate space for you so it could be your community of people with people whom you relate to people whom you want to relate to people whom you want to connect to people whom you want to help with people whom you want to be helped by in it is in those contexts that you can bring out yourself as a philosopher by the ability to put 
in perspective the different components which are existing existing when you analyze a situation or by doing what you can in the best manner possible be good in what you do and philosopher a philosopher is one who can do what he or she does in a very good manner because the whole idea of excellence the theory of excellence goes back to philosophical thinking so definitely there is nothing called theoretical philosophy it's actually an oxymoron to say that philosophy apart from being theoretical can it be practical there is nothing called theoretical philosophy if at all we say that theory is based on a practice a living practice and all our philosophers have proved time and again that philosophy is not just a theory to write in a paper which you don't understand i don't understand no philosophy is a practice which you apply in the most complex manner or in perhaps in the most subtle and simpler manner the next question is hindi uh manav sharir ka panchwa pavan kya hai o kisi ki kisi kisi sthan par rehte hai bahut badhiya acha ye prashant hota i think that's a very good question at that question perhaps you can just do a google search to know which are the five pranas because my talk was not about the pranas which is an interesting question but you can immediately get it in google search just say panja prana it will come out okay yeah yeah i think i may i intervene may i intervene hello yes please Approach. yeah okay now uh, professor sangeeta i am gasper from the department of philosophy government college for women trivandrum thank you very much for the talk thank you very yes. much for the talk professor uh, with reference to the cause effect relation uh, this is a comment only when we say that there is a cause for everything then naturally we can deduce from that statement that anything can be a cause for anything else so without having the reference to responsibility and the freedom the notions of responsibility and freedom if we talk about cause effect relation then this problem or this uh, uh, problematic uh, paradoxical situation arises if everything is connected anything can be a cause for anything else how can we solve this paradox then this is my uh, simple question and a comment what would you think dr gasper how would you respond to that <laughs> if there is only one color then there is no color at all if i if i am permitted to use a metaphor um, when i say that if there is only one color for example yellow is there only yellow is here then there is no color in the same way if i say there is cause for any effect then anything can be a cause for any effect because everything is related and connected to then how can we differentiate a cause from a effect from an effect or a specific cause for a specific effect uh, what is the logic or what is the rationale behind such a statement how can we approach such a yeah, how would you respond that's what i'm requesting you what would your response i just love to, i just i just love to know your response for that well, that's your this, question uh, but i would love to know what's your response to your question <laughs> okay. please actually do. i do not know how to answer it i do not okay, actually so then how to answer it you have a question with and without an answer but i think i jokes apart uh, as much as i could understand you i will just say in a simple manner cause rela- causal relation is not connecting oranges and apples right there is something called class perceptions category perceptions and uh, there are uh, set principles which you learn so we arrange things either by similarity dissimilarity difference by being in a relation for example there is a relation between a tree and a branch so there is a relation between a branch and a leaf 
there, there's a discussion on how you categorize things in both Indian philosophy and uh, Western philosophy. But let's not go into those uh, ways of understanding causal relation. I think what is important is to say uh, that uh, we always see how is something connected to another thing. And please remember that we are all sensible people. We are all intelligible, intelligent people. So for example, uh, uh, to take your question a little further, I wouldn't say that, oh, I couldn't cast the best today and I was late today. I mean, not today, today's Sunday. So let's say tomorrow, if it is, if it, uh, I'm sorry, today, let's say, imagine it's a Monday. And I say, I couldn't cast the best. And uh, so I'm late. So someone asks, uh, why are you late? Oh, I am late because uh, because uh, Trump was not impeached. Is that an answer? Which means, and what, what would you respond if someone answers like that? You would either think that person as mocking you or pulling your leg or is out of its wits, right? So in common day-to-day -day life, we expect people to see a logical connection between what he says, his action, and his response. So it's not that causal relation is just something, a relation just like that. A causal relation is something which has a proven history, has uh, a lot of connections which is established by production, by being together, by emanating from something, and so on and so forth. So there's a huge um, uh, uh, material available to understand causal history, nature of causes, causal relations, and almost all philosophers have talked about it. But that's a very short response to you, um, Mr. Oh, thank Dr. you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the and, response. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone has asked me, can you, can you narrate doing philosophy from Indian perspective? I didn't understand your question, J.R.B. First of all, there is nothing called Indian perspective or Western perspective, right? We live in India, you see a lot of technology in the world. A lot of products are made from different parts of the world. But if you are asking me, according to Indian philosophy, how do we do philosophy in Indian philosophy? A lot of background noise. Uh, hello. Can you unmute a little bit? Yeah. Hello. 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 Yeah. Uh, hello. Yes. Hello. Complete, complete that response, please. So, okay. if you are asking, um, how how do you do Indian philosophy? Well, I don't think we should think about doing philosophy in that manner. What question? What problem do you want to do in Indian philosophy? Are you interested, for example, in, in, in Indian aesthetics? So, can you ask what is the idea of uh, beauty, and is there a comparison, perhaps, with what can described as a reflective judgment, or do we thought about uh, beauty? That's a comparative philosophy. But if you only want to look at, let's say, Indian philosophy, you can look at Abhinava Gupta's Indian aesthetics, or a lot of other aestheticians whom Abhinava Gupta had, uh, um, had consulted and uh, combined their philosophy in his works. So firstly, ask a problem, not a particular geographically defined uh, Philosophy. What is that which you are interested to do in philosophy? Hello, ma'am. Yeah, I Can just. You hear me? Yes, yes I'm there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, teacher, uh, my uh, my my problem in mean, my question is, uh, can you explain or narrate the methodology of doing philosophy from an Indian perspective? Or the, that's my question. The methodology of doing. There's not a methodology for Indian perspective. There's a methodology only for a research problem. Indian perspective is just a combination of uh, a geographical place and a particular viewpoint. What is that which you want to do? So, for example, that's why I gave you the example of Indian aesthetics. So, for example, if you want to do Indian aesthetics, what method, method would you do? You would definitely have to do a textual analysis. You may have to do a narrative analysis. You may have to do some other methods also, right? Interpretational techniques and so on and so forth. It depends upon what is your area to define what is your methodology. Uh, and in general, philosophy is known to be using the method of descriptive analysis and descriptive narration a lot. Okay, ma'am. Uh, if, if I choose a conscious studies for my doing as, as a research, 
so what is the which is the methodology am i adopt for that uh, what are you doing jrb at this point uh, i'm doing uh, mphil i see so what i suggest is when you go back home google start with consciousness studies make a list of the 100 first pages what you get and you will understand what is consciousness studies when you ask that question what is consciousness studies it's asking like if i want to swim in a uh, pacific ocean what should i do i cannot say an answer to it right you have to come up with a very specific question about mind or consciousness in that area and your method so you write to me Thank then you, i can help you i can help you um, a little bit on what your thinking is yes sure ma'am i've got it One more question I see is based on your in-depth talk. Can I say existing self exploring the universe through knowledge for happiness? Okay, I think Gautam Ghosh, that person. I think I see uh, his name uh, from some of our Friday talks. I'm, I hope I'm right. Yeah, you can say that, Mr. Ghosh. You you can say that. I'm assuming he's that person. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. yeah anybody else um, so you can also give answers not necessary always questions <laughs> yeah somebody I, i think i stopped one uh, person man uh, the person uh, Uh, i i can't see yes. your name let me just see what you name can you give uh, yeah kumari sunita i think she tried to ask me something yeah uh, uh, yeah uh, dr sankita uh, see uh, again i i'm also having i i'm just just little anxious about uh, your presentation on cause effect relation and uh, basically in generally cause and cause you know as a philosophy teacher uh, you know uh, cause and effect cause is an invariable unconditional antecedent of a phenomena you already mentioned i just giving a just a definition of that you know uh, always you know always coming before effect and uh, my uh, and also you know that you know uh, the humean causation he made a, he, he he also you were also discussing about there is a necessary Uh, logical connection between cause and effect in your talk you know later uh, when uh, gas gas peras for it you were discussing that my query is you are connecting two different realms you know two different contexts one is in the modern perspective you know causal really cause and effect relation in a modern perspective i am connecting with the life you know now so you, said, you also mentioned that which them would be reflected by Are reflected by our ability to put the knowledge and all those ideas to practical purposes of life and also he said wisdom concerns the practical purpose of life how we choose to live our li lives and everyday basis that's also you said and i think you connected that with you know uh, cause effect relation my query is again one one thing another thing you said is this is not a mod uh, this is not a you know uh, this is it can be you know you are looking at this in a modern perspective there is a primitive society also there was a cause effect relation my again my little is you again you are connecting with the two different you know uh, context modern and the primitive one i uh, even the modern society that the cause and effect relation when can be verified but primitive uh, even so probate you work how what are the kinds of you know the method you used to uh, evaluate that cause cause relation cause cause effect relation that's a, my uh, i'm just little anxious about that another one uh, you, uh, i want to say can we take one at a time yeah take okay fine so thank you so much uh, uh, for being anxious no, very well i think we are we are together in a, uh, we are together I mean i was a little five years i think that we will talk about after this so we will address okay. this formal question which you have right i think i got you 
I, I think I did get you by your name. So, but let's focus on your question now, okay? Uh, first of all, thank you for being anxious because recently I haven't met anyone who becomes anxious when they meet me. So thank you for being that. <laughs> so that's not a good compliment though. Uh, well, I think you have put across a lot of statements from what I have said from the beginning to the end. I don't think that's a good way of synop making a synopsis of what someone says. You have to put it in the context. And, uh, and I also think you were, you didn't contradict anything which I said, though I was very keenly listening to you. And uh, when I talk about cost relations, I work in brain sciences, neuro neuropsychiatry and neuroplasophy. That is number one, that's my discipline. I may not be very uh, adept in uh, ethnography, for example, though I do work in ethnography as well, uh, because we also have projects in health and medicine. So I don't know which example you took in order to talk about causal relation, because the whole idea of causation is not just a theoretical mumbo jumbo. Causal relation has fundamental establishment in scientific development, which is from the Newtonian times, which you study in philosophy of science, which I think you might have. And it also is one of the hottest topics, which is always debated and contended in today's scientific understanding. And the whole word scientific itself is debated. So I didn't even want to use that word. But since you brought it up, and again, I don't think uh, you almost was echoing what I said. So I didn't see a contradiction in what you were saying. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't usually bring in these historical definitions such as modern and primitive. Because to me, that is not the way of classifying geographies. That's not the way of classifying histories. Because there's nothing called primitive, there's nothing called modern. Because modernity is uh, yeah. ridiculed by perhaps the next history. But we can talk about digital spaces because that is something which, again, uh, is very, very important. Because today you know how many people suffer of not having a digital platform in order to learn in the classrooms? So when we bring in philosophy and these fundamental aspects, if you bring in the example of a social phenomenon, we will be able to understand. Otherwise, we can only make generic statements. But then a question, you can take a question and discuss about it. So I'm very happy if you wish to write to me with a particular question and we can talk about it. Thank you. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Again, the connection with, you know, social uh, scientific realists, as you said, you are working on, you know, scientific realist uh, approach to, you know, denying their hostile towards cost, cost in general and, you know, human causation. Again, I understood what from your first question itself, I understood your position. No need to explain. Thank you. I don't think scientists deny causal relation because if you look at uh, neuropsychology and neuro, neurobiology, no. neuroscience is today fundamental. And in fact, that is, you have brought in a very exciting topic. I will only take one minute since you brought in a topic which is not connected with today's lecture, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neuroscience is fundamentally embedded in causal relation. You have to, you know, read some of these books in brain sciences to understand how even today, something called visual perception is so much relying on physiology perhaps which is uh, 50 years back. But what is interesting, Sunita, is the questions which is asked about visual perception. Yeah. That is where you see the philosophical uh, intervention and uh, where neurobiology has to think very differently from perhaps the last 50 years. So it's an extremely exciting field if it comes to brain sciences. So I don't know in which area of philosophy of science you work, but uh, neuroscience is where you see a fundamental influx of the old idea of causation. But then there are works like Bernard Barth's so Theater of Consciousness, right? I don't know uh, whether you, you are aware of these books. Yeah. And there are so many other books which fundamentally question the simple causal relation because it yeah. just doesn't fit in. And that yeah. is why the very interesting Chalmersian problem, the heart problem, which brings in uh, the riddle of dualism, 
and which cannot yes. explain consciousness as a product, nor can it explain as a narrative. So if you take, for example, if you read the works of Feinberg, Todd Feinberg, you will see how scientifically, quote unquote, the ability for a self to narrate oneself is brought in in the context of scientific thinking, which is very much embedded in physiology in brain sciences. So we have to take these questions in the, with the help of very specific examples. Then we will be un, able to understand. Yeah. Otherwise, it becomes very theoretical, which yeah, yeah. we can argue and core a point, but it may not help us. Yeah, thank you. I think somebody else was trying to ask a question. Uh, I don't know who Dr. that person is. Uh, wanted to speak. Dr. Lakshmi, if you are available, can you please unmute yourself and speak? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, it's not, uh, not related to the talk, but uh, I would like to know from you uh, about uh, some of the research pro programs or projects run by NIAS where our students can, yeah, is this uh, Lakshmi, Dr. Lakshmi, a former SOD or uh, no? Is it another person or? Uh? <laughs> we, know, we know each other. We know each other. Is this yes. Lakshmi, the former HOD of the Department of Philosophy, yes. whom I met earlier? Yes, yes. We know each oh, other. Okay. We met uh, maybe four yeah, yeah. oh, to five years ago. Oh, yeah, a very nice meeting you, Dr. Lakshmi. And thank you for being there. Yeah, I would love okay. to answer this question, okay. but uh, I think as I replied to Sunita, uh, today we will take the questions related to the lecture because it's a professional lecture. Any other questions, please feel free to write to me. My email IDs are on the chat box. And Dr. Lakshmi, I completely agree with you that we need to discuss about a lot of initiatives which we can do. And I think I was uh, also trying to uh, have a discussion with uh, your present HOD, Dr. Nasneen, on this. Uh, there are lots of ways of helping students and helping ourselves first as philosophy teachers. But uh, let's discuss about it. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. OK. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Vijay, is that it, or is there uh, anybody? I think uh, we can now move on to the uh, the. Is uh, there any other question somebody wants to, or question or answer? Uh, Ma'am, I think there is a question from Rupsana. Oh, okay. I can't see it. I mean, did I miss? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I didn't. Um, Yeah, uh, I can't see that. Uh, can someone read it for me? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Uh, she has asked about the role of philosophy in understanding the self. Oh, um, uh, what is uh, Rukhsana doing now? Is she uh, she's a postgraduate student? Rukhsana, you can unmute. Possible? Fifth semester degree student. Oh, OK. Uh, apparently, she may be not there, right? Uh, she's unable to speak about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, poor network. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is one <laughs> drawback of the digital spaces. Um, uh, well, I, I think it may need a little more long discussion, given the interesting definitions and responses you made earlier, and this question you asked me now. So I don't want to just give you a one-liner answer and finish it. I would rather like to have a conversation with you. Would you like to email me with that question and let's have a chat? Is that okay, Roxana? Because I would like to know, uh, you know, some of the other elements in that question you have. So please do email me. Yes. So you have my email ID. It is there in this chat box, and you can write to me, OK? And uh, Rajeshri Vasudevan has written a wonderful talk. Thank you. Happy to hear the mention of Abhinav Gupta, on whom 
I did my research is absolutely Rajeshri Vasudevan. Very few people do work on Indian philosophy, uh, particularly relating to Kashmir Shaivism and Indian aesthetics. So thank you so much for saying that you have done your work. I, I actually uh, uh, didn't know that this person is Rajeshri Vasudevan. Is she uh, a, a, a teacher or a student or a, is a scholar? Yeah. <clears throat> Namaste, I'm uh, Dr. Rajshri here. Namaste. Uh, I'm actually a, a faculty. I'm from Chennai. Uh, okay. And I took up uh, Abhinav Gupta, particularly because I'm a performing artist. So uh, I'm a student in of uh, Dr. Padma Subramanyam. Oh, so okay. I did the work because it was the commentary on the Nati Shastra. I wanted to work on Abhinav Bharati. Uh, and uh, I happen to be the student of Dr. Godavari Shamishra uh, in the Department of Philosophy, Madras University. So uh, it was a very, very interesting uh, talk that you gave today. And I think I should thank uh, Dr. Vijay, who happens to be my uh, junior from the university, for uh, sending me this invite. And uh, I particularly like the way you uh, elicited a lot of uh, responses, even from uh, students. So I think uh, they found the talk very uh, non-intimidating because of which they could open up yeah. and uh, speak to you because philosophy can uh, scare people. Yes. Uh, and I think it was okay. a very wonderful way of uh, bringing it out and uh, they came up with such wonderful responses. So I think it was a great, uh, great session today. So thank you so much for that. And I would like to connect with you. So since I have the mail ID, Yes. I would be sending across the mail so that we can connect. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Rajshri Vasudevan. I definitely would like to connect with you because we have deeper interest in Indian aesthetics. And Abhinav Gupta is one of those yes. philosophers, very little studied by people. So someone asked me, how about an Indian philosophy perspective? You know, look at Indian aesthetics. Or look, in, look at uh, those philosophies which may not be listed uh, in Radha Krishnan's or, you know, our uh, TMB Mahadevan, uh, I think he mentions about Kashmir Shaivism, so I can't uh, take his name. But these are very interesting philosophies, and aesthetics it itself is very, very interesting because today there is something called emotion studies, and there's a journal connected to emotion studies. And uh, it's amazing that in here we have done a lot on emotions, but it's just that it's all classified under aesthetics. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing. So I would I'd definitely like to connect with you, madam. Yeah, and I think uh, I one that... letter. Yes, please. No, yes. Yes, sorry, sorry. No, I said I found that very helpful in many situations. So I think, uh, as mentioned, you can take it over. Yes. That people are waiting to ask you questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Rajshri Vastavan also has written, yeah, I agree with you, modern and traditional relative terms. The term primitive is at a different level, I think, has certain negative. Yeah, I think, yeah. So what is primitive? What is modern? This is actually an old definition and uh, distinction. We don't no more talk about that. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Sanita has asked, with the help of neurophilosophy, could you explain the self? And who is Sanita, please? Is she a student or a faculty or? You may be not. the person who is smiling now? Yes. Okay. She's a, she's a faculty of University College. You may be knowing her. Oh, that's so nice. Like All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Sanita, I think uh, if you want me to respond to that question, I have to take another two hours. That's why I asked you who you are. I don't know you would have the patience for that much because the neurophilosophy of self is an extremely vast and wide area, but, uh, but very, very interesting questions because in consciousness studies, self is one of the very prominent concepts which is discussed today. And uh, so it's amazing to discuss. Uh, please email me. Uh, we can refer to some of the books which can give you some insights. Um, I, I think at least there would be some interesting uh, works from at least six to seven philosophers and uh, uh, also not just philosophers, also psychiatrists and uh, neuroscientists. Uh, Ma'am, do you defend uh, Ganeri's position?
What is that? Do you defend the Ganeri's position? First, you have to tell me what, this is which Ganeri you are talking about no, and no, what's no, the Jonathan, position? Jonathan Ganeri. Jonathan Ganeri. Which position is that? Uh, position of uh, status of self. self. Uh, well, I, that's that's huge, right? Uh, which position? I mean, what what position? Because I know Ganeri quite well, so I have to <laughs> find out what he said. So if you can tell me what position he is talking about, then I can tell you. His concept of self. Yeah. What is his concept of self? I want to know more from you. Well, I would like to know what you want to ask, right? I mean, when you say uh, Jonathan Carradine's concept of self, he has brought in books and volumes on it. He has also brought in edited volumes. He has a very complex a nuanced way of understanding the self. Yeah. All right, anything, any other question? Uh, I don't see the wonderful... Is there any other question? Am I missing anything, uh, Dr. Vijay? Otherwise, should we... I think it's time for us to wind up. Uh, Sajna, please take over. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your beautiful response. As the session is going towards its end, I would like to invite Dr. Vijay, Assistant Professor, Department of Philosophy, Government College for Women, to deliver the vote of thanks. Welcome, sir. Yeah, thank you, Sajna. Uh, I'm sure that each and every participant of this lecture would agree with me that it was a most rewarding and enriching experience for all of us to listen to Professor Sangeeta Menon. And uh, it exactly went on the lines in which I had anticipated it. Because Professor Sangeeta actually uh, took us to the dimension of doing philosophy. Uh, actually, uh, what uh, struck me the most was that she took three concepts which are usually uh, spoken of as completely metaphysical, uh, otherworldly, uh, uh, in common parlance in philosophy. That is knowledge, self, and purpose. She connected all of them together and uh, she was really doing philosophy because uh, she elicited responses from the students and on the basis of that she connected ideas and uh, uh, philosophy was uh, just being worked out right in front of us. So she has set before us a great example to emulate. Philosophy is not just about history of philosophy but philosophy is all about how you do philosophy. Philosophy is a living enterprise. It is a process of unfolding yourself, it is a quest. And uh, I think this is the basic idea that really came out of this particular lecture. And I am thankful to you from the bottom of my heart for uh, uh, you know, presenting in front of our students such a wonderful example, which, is, which I believe is an eye-opener to many of our students. And, uh, and also for encouraging them for looking at philosophy from a different angle. It is we who downsize the importance of philosophy, the teachers and students of philosophy. And if we just change our perspective of looking at philosophy, I'm quite sure that uh, we can take philosophy uh, in India to very great heights. And uh, uh, we have great leaders like Professor Sangeeta Menon to lead us and show us the path. Thank you, Professor. Now I'll embark upon my duty. I just wanted to put in those few words as my reflections on uh, uh, this uh, uh, enterprise. First, I'd like to uh, thank our dear principal, Professor uh, Arvind Krishnan, sir, for joining this uh, we uh, webinar, even though it's a Sunday. He was there in the institution and he joined us. And uh, he, he has been a constant source of inspiration uh, with his jokes and, you know, with his uh, punchy words and all that. He really motivates us to work as a team. Thank you very much, sir for sparing your time and your words with us. Now, uh, regarding Professor Sangeeta Menon, what I really fall short of words to thank. The, the department wholeheartedly thanks her. Uh, we express our very deep sense of gratitude to you, ma'am, for uh, sparing time out of your very, very uh, hectic schedule. I'm quite sure that you are doing a course right now. And I mean, you are conducting a course a workshop perhaps uh, right now and that is the reason why this uh, lecture had to be scheduled on a Sunday but uh, you know it was really uh, your words were real nectar and we loved 
uh, listening to you hope that we could collaborate more with your wonderful institute and with you and have many more programs so that we can motivate our students to uh, research and uh, higher ventures in philosophy thank you ma'am thank you so much Uh, next, I'd like to thank uh, the teachers, research scholars, and students from different institutions throughout India who joined. A very good number have joined today because uh, the program was shared in the official Facebook page of the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. And thanks to that, many people from all over India, from different uh, parts of India, as far north as uh, Rajasthan, they could join and uh, participate and be enriched uh, by this program. Uh, I thank all of them from the bottom of our heart. And um, for this reason itself, I'd like to thank the Indian Council of Philosophical Research for, you know, uh, funding this program and for making this program a reality. Next, I'd like to thank the faculties from uh, various departments of philosophy in Kerala, especially to mention a few: University College uh, uh, Tiruvannamalai, NSS College Nirmalakara, uh, Talasheri Brandon College, uh, Government College Chittu, Maharaja's College, and others who joined. Uh, there is the almost the entire uh, philosophical fraternity from kerala joined this webinar most of the teachers were there so i thank all of them from the bottom of our heart for joining and taking time out on a sunday and that to a valentines day and joining this webinar it really reflects their thirst for knowledge thank you one and all then uh, faculties from other departments of women's college have also joined i i thank them uh, for that and uh, next i'd like to thank our beloved hod dr nasneen And our uh, faculty members, Dr. Sandhya, Dr. Gaspar, Dr. Shri Kumar, Dr. Ambli, and Dr. Mangalya, who we always work as a team, and uh, you know, uh, it is the uh, you know the bonding that exists in the department that has made possible all our joint ventures. And I'd like to thank all of them from the bottom of my heart uh, uh, for making all this possible. Without their insights and inputs, it would never have been a reality. Next, I'd like to uh, thank our research scholars. A special mention to Nikhila and uh, Sajina who compared the event. Uh, Nikhila for introducing the speaker to us. I thank both these research scholars and the other research scholars of the department. Then I'd like to thank all the students of our department. Uh, they too joined in good numbers. They, uh, you know, they put in their ideas. So many, like Anjana, Rupsana, just to mention a few of them, they took an active part in it. And that is really what we experience when we teach in the women's college as well, because they take an active role in all the all that ha happens in the department, and uh, that really encourages and motivates us to go ahead. Uh, thank you, dear students. You are our strength. You are our pillar of support. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, uh, I'd like to thank each and every one. I'm uh, sorry if I've left out any person. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of the Department of Philosophy, I'd like to thank each and every person once again for joining this uh, lecture program. Hope to see uh, most of you again on 18th. Uh, I hope to share with you the details of the third ICPR lecture, which will be delivered by uh, Dr. Shri Kumar Malikapalli, Professor of Philosophy at IIT Madras, on the 18th. Uh, the details and the meet code will be shared uh, through the social media handles uh, of the department. And uh, 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 this session was recorded and it will be uploaded in our YouTube channel. And for those who could not join today or uh, because of some network issue or anything, this will definitely be aired uh, on YouTube. And you will certainly be able to view it. So thank you once again, one and all. Thank you very much. And a special thanks to Dr. Nasneen and Dr. Vijay for giving me a beautiful evening. As I said in the beginning, uh, you know, it, I don't think many people will get an opportunity to talk about your love for philosophy on the Valentine's Day. So thank you so much, and thank you all for your patience, your insights, and uh, sharing your views with me. I really appreciate that. Thank you all. And I also thank the principal, Professor Krishnan, uh, who I think was there in the beginning. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It's our privilege to listen to you. Thank you.